Hey you, welcome back to yet another video. This week I want to talk a little bit about look creation. I've always thought it's one of the most interesting parts of creating, especially in film. Getting a look to your film is one of the most essential parts of color grading. To me it's one of the most exciting parts as well. I've always wondered when watching movies like, how did they land on those colors? Why those colors in particular? Well in the past, the photochemical process was a large part in determining your look that you got in a certain film. The film stock that you chose and acquired, the film negative on played a big role in how your film looked at the end. As a matter of fact, people still model their looks, a lot of looks that are out there, after photochemical film stocks as well to this day, which is pretty cool in my opinion. More and more now with digital image acquisition though, you are kind of set free from those constraints. You can kind of play around with any colors you want. You're no longer held to just color timing and film stock that determine the look of your film. So with that in mind, let's talk about one of the most popular looks out there, teal and orange, or amber and blue, blue and orange, whatever you want to call it, but it's one of the most popular looks out there in Hollywood. Full disclosure, I think this is a really cool look and I think that there's many variations on it. You can kind of put your own spin on it by playing around in Resolve and I think that's one of the coolest parts of this look as well. And I'll kind of try to show you why I think it's cool along the way in this video as well. Has it been overdone? Eh, maybe if you choose to see it that way. Has it definitely been done bad in the past? Yeah, I would say so. But I think there are multiple reasons why it's so popular and I think you'll see why during the course of this video. So we'll cover some of the reasons why teal and orange is a popular look and then I'll show you guys a way to get it in Resolve as well uh, and we'll get a little bit into look building. Before we keep going though, Thank you so much to everyone that subscribed so far. We finally did it, we hit a thousand subscribers and now we're growing past that as well. So I really wanna say thank you so much to everybody that's been here along the way. Thank you so much to those of you who have subscribed and watched these videos so far. Really appreciate every single one of you and the people that comment and like the videos and stuff like that. I really appreciate each and every one of you. Hopefully it gets just a little easier from here on out, but if you could do me a favor before we jump into this video, don't forget to subscribe if you're not subscribed already and hit the like button as well so I can get this video out to more people and we can keep growing the channel. Now this look is primarily based on two colors. We have the teal and the orange. It's a misconception kind of, and I've heard it said that all of it looks exactly the same. I don't personally think that's true, and I'll show you some examples. Now, there's a lot of different ways to get this look. Some films that are shot today are actually still shot on actual film negative stock, which helps contribute to this look. Others try to replicate this look digitally, and now we have all these tools at our disposal in Resolve, for example, to play around and try to get this look as well digitally. And of course, we also have so many different shades of blue. You have more teal, more green, blue looking images, and same still, all of the lighting choices, set design, and color grading choices that you make can also cast a tint on a skin, for example. Now, I don't think any one of these is particularly better than the other. I think it's what your intent is as a filmmaker. Now, I said I would talk about why this look is so popular. So, when you're color grading, I think there are certain anchors or pillars that you wanna use in your color grading that definitely take precedence over all other considerations. One of these anchors or one of these considerations is skin tones. If we jump into Resolve and look at our image, I have a couple we can go through, but let's pop out our scope at, just for guidance and look at the vector scope. If we click on the options here and check show skin tone indicator, it'll put this line over our scope. That's the skin tone line. No matter what shade you are of skin, it'll fall on this line. That doesn't mean there can't be slight creative differences. Sometimes because of the lighting or the conditions, it'll be skewed a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right. Um, and that's fine, but for the most part, I wanna stick as close to the line as I can get it. Naturally, that line sits between our reds over here and our yellows on this side of the vector scope. So that naturally gives us the orange part of the look. So in film, we're usually looking at a human subject. Since we have one prong of our complementary colors here, we'll wanna create separation. Now, you wanna do this for a number of reasons, but for split complementary, the color scheme itself, it's very pleasing to the eye because it naturally creates color contrast. Just as like we push both sides of the histogram or the waveform apart when we're introducing contrast in terms of luminance, we can also introduce contrast in a different way with color contrast. Having that contrast and separation in your image will also bring focus to your subject in terms of the skin tones, but also helps separate your skin tones from the background as well. That creates a more pleasing look overall 
wall and also draws our eye in the frame to look at the subject instead of everything else going on in the background. Usually our eyes are drawn to the brighter parts of frame, so a lot of times we're gonna push cool tones into the shadows and then have the orange tones in the highlights. Going back to my principle of anchoring your looks with skin tones, we're already going this way, so of course pulling in the opposite direction will result in blue or teal being added into the image. So the answer as to why it's blue or why it's teal is pretty easy. For one, it's the color contrast that we're looking for in our image. Also, it's naturally occurring. If we look at this image, for instance, we have skin tones and a blue sky. Even if I did nothing else except increase the contrast a bit and maybe saturation, you can see the colors naturally move apart in those directions just as part of nature. So a few things to consider. For one, when I'm grading, I always wanna base my grade on how the image looks using my eyes. Now that's a separate topic in and of itself, but I'm not a very big believer in color correction. A lot of people will mention that. Like for example, you have to correct an image all the way before you start grading it. I'm actually not a fan of that. I don't, to be honest with you, I don't do color correction really in terms of getting my looks. I mainly use my eyes because what feels natural to my eyes, uh, especially on like a reference monitor or something like that, is usually gonna feel right to everybody else. And mainly film, you're looking for a feeling. You're not necessarily looking looking for what's the most correct. We're not sending something out to broadcast, which in that case, maybe color correction is more applicable. And that's really where the color correction part of color grading comes in from. But for film, I'm looking to get a creative look. So I wanna take my image in the direction that I wanna go. I don't wanna to have to correct it and then try to go in that direction, if that makes sense. But color correction was how color grading was taught to me when I first started as well. So going back to this image, I wanna use my eyes to try to get the look, but I can use my scope as a little bit of a guide, or if I'm not sure what might be feeling off with an image, I'll use my scopes then too. More of like a diagnostic tool than relying on it to tell me what the answer should be. The skin tone line, like we already mentioned, really helps with that. If I'm anchoring here, then whatever I do to the rest of my image, I'll probably be okay. If we look at our references here, skin tones can vary as well, so there is room to be creative even in this framework. Something like Joker, if we look at this shot over all skews a little more yellow and green. It's still going towards blue and cyan, but it has a much greener hue to it. If we isolate the skin, for example, get rid of the softness here, because I don't want that, you'll see that they are anchored to this line. We can even put a 2x zoom on this on the vector scope and dim the edges of the vector scope here just so we can see a little bit better, and you'll see we're like right on the line. If we look at this image from Dunkirk, for example, still teal and orange, but this time much more heavily towards that teal blue than green. Not as much of a green tint in this one, and if we do the same thing and isolate the skin again, same thing, we're anchored on that line. Maybe a touch less saturated in this image than the prior one, but the principle is still the same. So a big part in creating this look is gonna be split toning. One way you can do that is using our custom curves. This is a very useful tool, especially when we're creating a look from scratch. If we want, we can even pop out the curves here to get a little bit more control. Now, I always start my images the same way, and that's color management. That gives us a very necessary base going from log to normalizing our image into a working color space. I cover this more in depth in other videos on the channel, but color management is a big part of the process and it's not optional for me. Now, if we look in settings, I'm outputting to Rec. 709 and working in DaVinci Wide Gamut for this one. Now, in this process, I'm gonna show you, this isn't based on like a mathematical thing. It's not based on a photochemical recreation. I'm just going to go by eye and show you how we can create something pleasing and achieve our base look. This process mimics what you'd find with certain film stocks pushing a cooler look into the shadows and a warmer look into the highlights. That's what is going to get us to our color separation and split toning to get the look we want. All right, I'm gonna do this in just two nodes. So the first one here, let's label contrast. We'll start messing around with it, with it until I feel comfortable. Maybe somewhere around 1.1, 1.2 I think looks good to my eyes. Maybe if I mess around with pivot as well, something around 0.5 I think looks good. If I check on my histogram as well, we're looking good. I have the, I think we have a pretty solid image for now. So overall, it's not bad if we take a look at our image. I think on the vector scope, we can see the image is leaning a little bit more towards this upper left vector here. We're a bit more warm and reddish on the whole. I wanna try and split this out and get more separation out of this image. 
So let's add a second node here and then label that our look. I'm going to expand the custom curves out so I have a little bit more control. And the first thing I wanna do is introduce some cool into the image. I'm not going for pure blue since that's not opposite our skin tones here, but I wanna aim a little bit between blue and cyan for this one. In order to do that, I'm gonna unlink the curves here by clicking this little chain link. That simply means I can affect the different channels separately and they won't pull together once I start messing with the curves. I'm gonna start with red and get a control point here. Now, everything above the line will be adding red and below I'm pulling red out. The opposite of red is cyan, so I'll be introducing cyan into the image. However, as I'm doing that, if I start pulling down now, you can see I'm affecting everything, including, I'm, I'm affecting everything at the bottom end of the signal, but also at the top as well. I'm effectively just color washing the whole image. So that's why I'm going to option or alt click here on the line and move this point down a bit. I don't want anything past this point to come down with this side of the line. And then we'll worry about the highlights after this, but let's just deal with the bottom end here. So I'll pull down and once again, I'm just going by eye here. So this looks good to me, I'll park it here for now. It's not a ton, but we are getting color into the shadows since we limited our curve here. And if I turn this off and back on again, you can see on the vector scope, we're starting to pull some of those colors and separate them a little bit. Okay, so next, this is very cyan, and I wanna give this a little bit of magenta in order to pull it more towards the blue as well. For that, I'll go to my green channel, and once again, I'll option click here and create an anchor point, and then I'll pull down on the green, meaning I'm introducing magenta. If we look at this vector scope while I'm doing this, we can see the cool part of the image is swinging a bit more towards the middle here between the cyan and the blue. And that's exactly where I want it. I usually never pull this green channel as far down as the red either because I do want it in between there. Now, if we want your image to have a bit more of that green cast, then you can leave it a little bit more cyan as well. I like where we've come on this image so far Let's deal with the highlights now. If we go back to the red channel, I'm going to create another anchor point, but it's gonna be pretty close to the bottom one here so we can affect more of the signal at the top and in the mids as well. In this case, I'm gonna pull up on the red channel. So if I look at our image, we're getting warmer now in the highlights. One thing I wanna do is give it a shoulder here too, just so that we have a nice roll off in the highlights especially at the very top. Now, something that'll look really good is I wanna go back to green and put an anchor point here as well. And then let's roll it off a bit below our red. And then we're gonna take the blue channel as well. And same thing, we're gonna add another shoulder here, and add an anchor and then roll that off just in the highlights as well. So your curve should look something like this. All right, so this is what we have and I'm pretty happy with where we ended up. If we do before and after now with all the curves done, you'll see we've made a pretty subtle change, but I think a huge difference in how the image looks. We've added a look to the image, but also neutralized it a little bit as well. We got rid of that overly warm tone that we can see now that we're doing a before and after, and we've stretched out our vector scope here a little bit into the two opposite quadrants, which is exactly what, we, what I wanted to do when I set out with this image. Lastly, if I put a window around the talent here on the well-lit side, you'll see our skin tones are right on as well. That's that anchor that I was talking about. So we stuck to our anchors here, skin tones are right where they should be. The image looks natural to my eyes, but we have that split toning, which gives it that signature look as well. And we did it using only two nodes and custom curves. There are also LUTs which are built to do the same thing, but this way you can see what's going on under the hood and you can apply this to different images as well. If something looks off or too much, you can adjust it by eye again and nail the feel of the image in your own work. And that's where I'm gonna leave it for this time. So two nodes, We've created our look. We can then take that node and paste it across our timeline if we want to, and that'll give us a similar look in all of the different images in our timeline. Of course, you can adjust it per image. You can uh, add another balance node after for specific clip shots that you want to adjust, and then you can do it on a clip by clip basis. But overall, we can have one look for our project. And I think we ended up in a really good spot as well. So like I said, that's where I'm gonna leave it. It was really simple, pretty painless as well for building a look like that in just two nodes and we did it fairly easily, probably in about five or 10 minutes. All right, now if you learned something, make sure you're subscribed, like I said before, hit that like button as well, share this video with someone if you want to, and until next time, go out there and create something. La vedere.